Everyone always asks me what it's like to sell a company. It can seem super glamorous with exponentially big numbers and amazing headlines, but it's also an emotional roller coaster. Let me walk you through what happened after we walked away from a deal with Google and how we got to selling our company to Amazon. How's it going? I'm Justin, Justin Khan from Justin.tv. Hey guys, it's me, Justin Khan, and welcome to my YouTube channel. Subscribe for more story times, advice, behind the scenes content, and more videos coming soon. Now, where did we leave off? After months and months of hard work, negotiation, and diligence, we had signed a deal with Google and then walked away from a billion dollars. So what were we supposed to do now? To take you behind the scenes, when you sell your company, there are four major stakeholders. The first is the founders and operators. So that was Emmett, the CEO, my co-founder, and myself and the other founders and management team of the company. Emmett and I were on the board of Twitch and most of the time in an acquisition, the board is gonna do whatever the founder and CEO wants to do. Two, you have the rest of the board. And this is mostly investors who have backed you that have board seats. Three, we have investment bankers we've hired, in this case, Catalyst, to help us navigate and negotiate the deal with prospective buyers. These guys are expert negotiators. Where we spend all our time building product, these guys spend all their time negotiating deals. After the Google deal fell through, which we tried to negotiate ourselves, we decided to hire Catalyst and they leapt into action to drum up more interest from another buyer. Four, you have the corporate development firm of the acquirer. So these are the professional negotiators on the other side that are trying to figure out, do they wanna buy your company and how much are they gonna pay? So in Silicon Valley, when one big company is talking to another smaller but still big-ish company about acquiring it, word gets around fast. And when one big company wants a deal, sometimes every other big company wants that deal too. Sometimes just to prevent the other company from having it. For example, after the deal with Google went sideways, Zuck actually called Emmett up and said, hey, I wanna invest $50 million and you guys should keep going. But the next big dog company to come knocking at our doors for an acquisition was Yahoo. Yahoo had been talking to us for a while, and after our bankers let them know that the company was still in play, they came back to us really quickly with a big number. $1.25 billion plus $250 million in retention. That was 50% more than what Google had just offered. Our minds were fucking blown. And we immediately said, yes, please, and thank you. At the time, because we have done all this painstaking diligence for the Google deal, we said, hey, let's just use the same documents and the same diligence, and let's agree to a quick two-week close. And Yahoo, for some reason, agreed. Then, the night before the deal was supposed to close, Emmett and the rest of the management team went over to Marissa Meyer's house. She was Yahoo CEO, and she wanted to do a final meeting. And Marissa had a vision for Twitch that I think encompassed Twitch expanding beyond gaming to everything from fashion shows to music. And unfortunately, there was a bit of a disconnect there. Emmett and the rest of the team felt like things were working with gaming and we should continue going with the direction we had. The next day, Yahoo told us they changed their mind. And just like that, $1.5 billion gone. We had literally gone from zero to $1 billion to zero to $1.5 billion to zero. Now by this time we were so exhausted and burned out. It had been almost six months of doing deals and we were looking for anything. And somehow Catalyst reactivated yet another buyer, Amazon. We started talking to their corporate development team and Emmett even met Jeff Bezos once. And then we agreed to do a deal. It was 1.2 billion with $200 million in retention. So how do these decisions get made? Well, after each offer, the board is obligated to discuss it. So we would get on a call, Emmett, myself, and the other board members, and talk about whether we thought it was a fair offer or whether we should keep going. And because the board is reliant on the management team, aka Emmett and the rest of the executives to run the company, we mostly wanted to do what he wanted to do. So the entire Twitch board is on a conference call. And we're discussing some of the minor details of the deal when one of our investors, Chris Pike, said, uh, I don't think we should do this deal. Hold up. Wait a minute. Something ain't right. This deal was going to make everyone around the table stupid rich. No one knows what to say. And there's dead silence. 30 seconds go by. One of our investors finally breaks in with, why not? And Chris says, well, I think the company's going to be worth more. 
And the other investor says, how, how much more? And Chris says, well, I think it could be worth three, four billion. I don't know. I just think it's going to be worth more and maybe we should keep going. There's another long silence. And then literally we just kept going like Chris never said anything. Everyone else just wanted to get this deal done. So we decided as a board, we're going to sell to Amazon. Third time's the charm. We're ready to sign this deal. Well, not so fast. Amazon Corp Dev calls us and said, well, they had a little bit of a change of heart and now the deal's priced at $970 million. Take it or leave it. And you know what? We took it. it. Wasn't quite the billion dollars that we wanted, but well, it was close enough. We were so fatigued from this whole process. We just wanted it to be over. And hey, that's still a life-changing amount of money. We've signed the deal. Amazon signed the deal. All our signatures are under lock and key by a bunch of lawyers. And the deal's set to close on Monday, August 25th, 2014. One small wrinkle, I was gonna be at Burning Man at the time and there's no cell phone signal or Wi-Fi at Burning Man. If you haven't been to Burning Man, it's an experimental community that happens out in the desert for roughly a week around Labor Day every year. And it's one of my favorite times. One of the cool things about Burning Man is that people build art. And one piece of art that they build is called an art car where they take a vehicle and they radically modify it so it doesn't even look like a vehicle. These art cars can be anything. Ships, there's a giant sheep, I've seen a giant scorpion. There's cars with tens of thousands of watts of speakers. There's cars with LEDs, there's literally everything. So I'd spent the entire summer building my own art car called Titanic's End. Titanic's End, which Emmett named, was a giant iceberg with 10,000 LEDs on the outside, built around a freezer truck. And if you crawled in that freezer truck, it would actually be cold, which was pretty cool when it was 90 degrees outside in the desert. So I told Emmett, hey, I'm going to be off the grid in Burning Man this day that we're supposed to close the deal. Do you need anything from me? And he was like, no, you're good to go. And so since I've been working around the clock to make this art car happen by the end of August, I said, F it, I'm going to go. And we drove the car eight hours from the Bay Area all the way through Reno to the Black Rock Desert in uh, northern Nevada. I set up my insulation foam hut that I was staying in. It was pretty janky, but you know, radical self-reliance. I'm so exhausted that Sunday night from everything we did on the deal and finally getting this art car to Burning Man. I just pass out in my hut. And overnight, I kind of hear these like pitter patter, pitter patter sounds. I'm like, oh, what's happening? I don't know. And I just sleep through it. And in the morning, I literally wake up in an inch of water. It had rained all night the night before. Everything I had in my ear was soaked. And that's how I woke up on the day that we sold our company. There's not really cell phone or Wi-Fi service at Burning Man. So I was trying to figure out, did the thing that was supposed to happen today happen? So after drying out all my shit, I literally walked around Burning Man for five hours trying to find camp with Wi-Fi or anyone that had an internet connection. And I basically had no luck until I walked back to my camp and saw my friend using her phone. And I was like, hey, can I borrow that for a second? And she had like one edge wireless or whatever, you know, it was like really terrible. But I was able to send a single text message to a friend. Hey, it's Justin. Did anything happen today? And after a harrowing dot, 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 all of a sudden he wrote, congrats. And that's how I knew we sold our company. Okay, so we closed with Amazon and now there's just one final hurdle, the US Department of Justice. So when the deal got announced, we actually didn't have any money yet. Everybody thinks you're rich, but you're not. The US Department of Justice has to approve the deal to make sure there's no antitrust issue. And once they do that, then you can get paid. For about a month, we were just waiting, dot, 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 dot. Then it was the end of September and our other co-founder, Kyle, was getting married in a castle in Italy. So we all went. Kyle happened to find the castle in Italy that was both the coldest, but also had the worst cell phone signal. The day of the wedding, we're supposed to get, be getting paid and I'm on my cell phone refreshing my banking mobile app. And then boom, it hits. And I see more money than I thought Bank of America could even hold. I, I remember thinking, hmm, I should probably turn on two-factor authentication on my bank account now. Everybody celebrated that night. Holy shit, we'd done it. We'd sold our company. So then on the trip, I decided, hey, I want to make my first big purchase. And I ended up going to a Prada outlet. This was like the Costco of Prada, a Prada superstore with pretty much everything on sale. So we walked out of there with a lot, but I mean, there was definitely people out there who were buying more than me. It was pretty funny. It was like every Asian person in China was there at that outlet in the countryside of Italy. So what happens next? 
Well, it turns out that once your basic needs are met, having more and more and more doesn't really do anything for your long-term happiness. I ended up going back to San Francisco, I bought a house, and I went to work at Y Combinator as a partner. Because I was on the board at the time and Emmett was running the company, I didn't have to continue on at Amazon, so I was free to do whatever I wanted. And it felt good to have that recognition of our last eight years of hard work finally paying off. At the time, people were mind boggled why Amazon would pay almost a billion dollars for a company that allowed people to watch streamers play video games. But today, in retrospect, it looks pretty good. Twitch has been valued at over 15 or $20 billion. So it looks like Amazon got a pretty good deal. Now the part you've all been waiting for, three key lessons for you. You can't get too wrapped up in selling your company. For us, the deal fell through three times. You can't control that outcome, so try not to get attached to a certain result. This applies to deals and it also applies to life. I try to actively remind myself that being too attached to outcomes is only gonna cause my future suffering if it doesn't happen. The sooner you accept that you can't control outcomes in the outside world, the freer you will be. Lesson two, equity is a gamble. It could turn into a life-changing payout and it could also turn into nothing. Only make this gamble if you can afford to do it, which usually correlates with being young and having no opportunity cost. This could have gone many different ways. We had tried to sell our company many times before and it didn't pan out. So in one way, we got very, very lucky. Lesson number three, which came a little bit later. The endless hedonic treadmill to accumulate more and more is a trap. And I know a lot of people will say, hey, Justin, it's easy for you to say that now. But to be honest, I wasn't any happier. Before the acquisition, I had enough to live. I was very comfortable. After the acquisition, I had a lot, but it didn't really mean my day-to-day -day was any different. I was still just as unhappy as I ever was. And it was only much later when I looked at what my internal motivations were and what are the things that really made me happy every day that I figured out how to find lasting happiness and peace in my own life. The desire to achieve and achieve and achieve is a trap. And this trap is something that we get into when we rely on the outside world to provide our motivators. Like, I wanna be famous, I wanna be rich, I wanna make more money, I wanna be somebody, I wanna do something out in the world. No achievement has ever lasted in a sustainable increase in my baseline happiness. That's only come from finding intrinsic motivators. Boom! And that was the story. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press that like button and subscribe for more. I'm gonna be doing many more videos. I'm having a lot of fun with this. So thank you very much for joining and I'll see you next time. And I'll see you next time. Bam! That was lame. All right, well, whatever, you got it.